Thanks, Neville. Uh, Richard, alcoholic, and very much an addict as well. Um, yeah, uh, excuse the nerves. I suppose it's, it's, I struggle to get vulnerable in front of people. Um, and that was like pretty much the, the theme of my life, really. Um, so I grew up in Joburg um, in a loving family, um, but not the kind of love that I was expecting. You know, I, my family wasn't really open um, much in terms of emotions. And I suppose I kind of, I was expecting like my family to be like Hollywood, you know, um, and it never really ended up like that. Um, and yeah, just really incapable of getting vulnerable and telling people how I really felt. Um, I was really introverted and shy, so I kind of learned learned my first kind of tool for my disease was to lie um, about how I felt, just to get people off my back or just to not to be fussed over. Um, and that was, yeah, that was my weapon of choice, was, was dishonesty. Um, I, I wasn't one for authority even, either. Um, hated the fact that I had to go to school didn't like being told what to do. Um, anything that my like, parents told me what to do, like I would do the opposite. Um, and eventually uh, I left school and, and my folks forced me into varsity, which I didn't want to do because I didn't know what I wanted to study. And so I just chose like the first thing that I can get into because my marks weren't that great, um, which was sports management. And uh, after two weeks, I, I dropped out without telling anyone um, and just pretended to go to varsity for about three months until the exams came up and I had to really then make a plan. Um, and in that time I was just really drinking with friends. Um, I started drinking in school probably around 17. Um, and when I started drinking it was like a lot of freedom I suppose. Uh, it, it allowed me to come out of my shell got a lot of confidence from it and I, I suppose I fell in love with the whole culture of drinking um, and so yeah every weekend probably in matric I was getting I was getting really drunk wasted to the point of passing out and vomiting um, but always lying my way out of it when my parents asked you know um, you say like my drink got spiked I don't know how many times um, and uh, yeah, always trying to stay at friends' houses so I didn't get in trouble from my folks so they never saw me. Um, just avoiding my family altogether uh, just so I could drink. And when I dropped out of varsity, I was just drawling with, with friends again and, and partying until I had to really come up with a plan B because I now had to tell my folks that I dropped out. So I would got a job waitering. Um, at a restaurant just around the corner from my house and then I felt like I could be honest with them and so I finally did get honest. Um, oh, also a little backstory, one of my biggest weapons I got was my dad, my dad went through a, like, quite a long phase of alcohol abuse. He's not really an alcoholic or wasn't an alcoholic um, but he did kind of abuse alcohol and he was strict and when he did drink it was like um, amplified I suppose and it was really like verbally abusive towards us um, and that I just held on to pretty much throughout my active um, as a reason to use you know it was always his fault it was because he did this because he did that um, and it was an, it was a lacquer excuse to go and use and drink um, and I, I wasn't willing to even see past it wasn't willing to forgive him because you know in my eyes my dad should have been perfect you know and um, yeah, when I started waitering uh, at that restaurant, we could drink on shift with customers, and this was like bliss for me, freedom. I could actually be myself, and I kept on coming home drunk uh, and having major fights with my dad uh, because he didn't agree with my drinking. And the minute I could move out, I did, and I, I left the house quite early on. Um, after leaving school and this was perfect for me because I could just literally go to work, finish work, make tips, 
and go to the pub and get trashed. And that was my, my routine every day. Um, I then loved it so much that uh, I chose it as a career. You know, I, I, I fell in love with the restaurant, or maybe at the time I thought it was the career that I wanted to do. But it was actually my disease just telling me, like, let's just follow this path because you can get trashed every night. Um, and it was socially acceptable, I suppose, in, in that setting. Um, everyone was doing it. Um, like, I was having a good time. My life was manageable at the time. Um, and I started, uh, yeah, I worked my way up to about to manager uh, in that position. And again, with a little bit more responsibility and a, a lot more of like manipulative and, and deceitful ways that I'd learned so that I could like chip over stock takes and get my way. I was, I was literally stealing booze out of that shop, drinking as much as I could. Um, and eventually the, the drinking progressed to a point of where I was probably doing like a bottle of whiskey a day easy um, for about 10 years. And I, I just felt empty, I suppose. There was, there was, I, my life wasn't going anywhere. It was just this, in this rut of going to the same bar, same people every day, just getting trashed, waking up with a, with a hangover, trying to get through my day and manage it as best as I could with a hangover. Um, and obviously with that came consequences, like my performance at work wasn't great. And how I got out of that was more lying and more deceits and more blaming of staff and rather than taking responsibility for myself. Um, I suppose at the time, like I, I had this vision or this idea of what an alcoholic was and I never fit that, that like stereotypical kind of idea. So I was in so much denial that I had a problem and that I was an alcoholic. I just, you know, I, I told myself that I loved the social occasion and, and all that bullshit. And um, that kind of led me to the point that that routine and cycle led me to a point of deep depression and hated my life, hated where, where I was, um, hated who I'd become, this just like the self-piteous, like, loser, I suppose, in a bar that just didn't want to really speak to anybody. Um, and I became very like suicidal, had suicidal thought, but just never really had the courage to do it. And so it carried on until, until I, fell, I fell into like a new crowd of friends that were, were doing drugs, I suppose. And um, I started just, I picked up drugs, doing like basic coke and cat on the odd occasion and um, fell in love with it. I thought, you know, I thought this was my savior. Uh, it pulled me out of that depression. I had suddenly a new lease for life, had a lot more energy at work and um, couldn't manage it on, on, on the come down, I suppose, because I was working quite often as probably like six days a week and about 18 hour shifts. So to get through that with the come down was damn near impossible. So I learned that I could just take drugs to work and do drugs at work. Um, and I thought that this was perfect. I, I was in this delusion where I thought that I could, that I, I was performing a lot better than I was when I was not using drugs. Um, I was a lot more chattier, a lot more friendly to customers. And this carried on for about five years. Um, and eventually that kind of progressed to a point where I lost a lot of interest in what I was doing. Um, I became a lot more distant from, from the restaurant, even though now at this point I'd, I'd taken over um, and bought the place um, on, a, on a funny deal. I didn't really have the cash to, to buy the restaurant, so I convinced the owner to sell it to me on a month-to-month -month basis and I would pay it off that way. Um, and now I'd eventually got to this, this goal that I'd set 10 years prior that I really wanted to own this shop and I'd finally got there and I was still unhappy. Um, I still hated myself, still hated what I was doing. And eventually, like I said, the progression took me a lot more, like, took my interests elsewhere, I suppose. In this new group of friends, I'd fun, suddenly found like the whole underground clubbing scene. Um, I was hanging out with a lot of club owners and DJs. Uh, it, it took me to places like I'd never thought I'd ever end up. 
Um, oh, also, sorry, one of the other consequences of, of the drink thing is I, I nearly crashed my car and killed myself. Um, I wrote off my car, thankfully no one was in the car, it was just me, I wasn't wearing my seatbelt, and ended up breaking ribs, broken nose, staples in my head, um, stitches in my lip, and that wasn't enough for me to even consider like uh, that I had a drinking problem. Um, it was just a one off you know, next time I went to drink and drive. And that lasted like two weeks until I was back on the drink again. Um, so yeah, fast forward years later, I was now going to these, these clubs and, and hanging out with the owners and I ended up packing, uh, I was packing pills for these owners in, in their one flat and I thought I was like part of this whole Breaking Bad kind of episode. And I thought this was a magic, you know, like I had come from this, this life of just going to the same bar in this like kind of upper class um, like area of, of Johannesburg that just I thought people were so fake to this now contrast of this underground scene of, of Joburg where people were using drugs freely and, and just being themselves. And I wanted more of that. I, I thought I was, I was free, you know. Um, and putting myself in, in dodgy situations like carrying like stock of ecstasies and pills across Joburg to this club and not even like caring about the fact that I could get locked up for a long time, you know, um, because I, I just wanted the admiration and, and the acknowledgement from these guys. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how I fell into DJing as well. So I, I, I fell in love with the scene so much that I started DJing and my priority was now fully focused on music and kind of just left the restaurant to its own devices. You know, I, I left it pretty much in charge of my manager and uh, my business partner who who is an alcoholic as well and quite deep in it at the time um so the shop was just sinking and sinking and sinking and i didn't care all i cared about was using all i cared about was my happiness at the time um and all of this was done in like this double life so my parents and my family had no idea that i was a drinking as much as i was b using drugs Every time I saw them, I was this other persona, like who, who, who they expected me to be. And um, I kept that double life up for long, for long, and they had no idea. Um, yeah, you know, sure, there was some times when I was acting weird, when I was high in front of them at, at family occasions, but again, like my manipulation and, and my lies got so good that I could convince anyone that I was normal, you know. Um, again, like as as far as that as far as that was concerned, I couldn't keep that up in my shop. Um, people could now like customers were cottoning on to what was going on. They could see that I was losing a lot of weight, bags under my eyes, just becoming a lot more distant. And any time that someone kind of suggested that I was using drugs, I would just back backlash at them, um, get completely defensive and angry. Um, just so I could carry on using. I didn't want anyone to, to get in the way. Um, I remember one of my friends was really concerned at the time, went and told my brother, and that, poof, um, I went bananas. Wrote off that friend, told that friend to leave, never want to see that person again, and I kind of, it, it ruined my, the relationship I had with my brother, I suppose, because he was really concerned, and I, I just, Again, blamed him, I blamed my father, I blamed everything from the past, just so I could carry on using. Um, and I always told them that it was just, you know, once, once or twice, it was never such a problem, even though I was using every day. Um, and eventually, eventually I had to close the shop because um, we couldn't afford our, our overheads and I was now without a job. Um, I had put, I had like so many staff, I probably have 35 staff that all lost jobs through that, um, all because I was just so focused on, on my using. Um, I wasn't ever present at the shop, I was hardly ever there, staff were doing what they wanted and I really didn't care. Um, because I, I suppose I didn't put any capital that I, that I had had to buy that shop, it was more of a, 
I just walked into the shop, convinced the owner to sell it to me on a month to month. I managed to pay him out um, over the three years and I felt that I got that shop for nothing, just hard work. So I was happy to just let it go. Um, again, in this delusion of this using where I could believe that I could get it any time I wanted because I, I worked hard for it and I, I th thought I could do it again easily. Um, and now I'm without a job, um, not willing to find another job now and I need bills to be paid I suppose and who are and and then now, now that I don't have an income I was like one of those moral addicts that couldn't steal from innocent people so moral addicts and uh, I, I then kind of targeted the people closest to me and that was my parents um, they enabled me for a very long time I manipulated them heavily um, which I'm, I'm not proud of um, and this was perfect for me my, my parents were paying my bills they were paying for my drugs essentially and I was chasing this pipe dream that I was going to become the superstar DJ and uh, I suppose like the, the income was a lot considerably less than what I was earning at the restaurant so I couldn't afford the drugs that I was using and eventually I, I went to harder drugs which is cheaper um, and that, yo, that was hectic. I, I suddenly went into deep psychosis for yo, three years where I thought I was living in this reality show and I was the star of this show and everybody around was recording on their phones, cameras behind mirrors, microphones in hidden places, like, like the stereotypical tweaker, I was that. Um, and uh, yeah, taking things apart like my toaster because I thought there was microphones in there and like, oh geez, it was mad. <laughs> and because my disease required me to use a lot more than I thought it did, um, how I got around that was I became very close with people that were selling drugs and that were cooking drugs and came to this situation where one of them didn't have a place to stay and uh, me being unselfish you know and very giving was like no, come and stay with me and i'll help you and we'll you know we'll get back get you back on your feet and the next thing her boyfriend moves in as well and we're now three of us he's cooking drugs at some other location but now paying rent to me with drugs which i thought was ideal um and I got into the, the, the whole selling drugs now. Um, I, was, I was carrying their stock on consignment and selling as much as I could. Again, didn't really care about the consequences, nor even thought about like me getting locked up. I just thought this was amazing because I was part of this reality show that was like covering drug addicts and like how the lifestyle was. And, so I just went with it and it took me to some weird dark places there. Eh? I was walking around Soweto, fearless in, in this like township, hanging around with gangsters thinking that this was all part of the show. Um, and I remember like tweaking out often and my friends that were staying with me at the time, I say friends, they weren't friends, um, they would play on this, this tweak of mine and like thought it was quite fun to entertain my, my delusion and my psychosis, so it was quite difficult to shake out of that. Um, and where it all came crashing down was when I, uh, my dad now was, was having brain surgery for his Parkinson's. He had been suffering from Parkinson's for about 20 years. And the day of the surgery, I was still partying at my house from an after party. It was like seven days straight, no sleep. Lots of people in my flat and I just said, yeah, cool guys, I'm just going to pop off to the hospital now. I'll be back for the jaw later. Um, and I got to the hospital thinking that it was all fake. Um, so this was when I kind of disclosed my madness to my family. Um, during such a stressful time because this, the surgery was like a 50-50% ch chance of survival and I wasn't being supportive at all. I was just blurting up my madness about how there's cameras everywhere and like 
my dad's been faking Parkinson's this whole time, and yes, it's, oh, I cringe to think of it actually. Um, and I just saw the sheer like distress on my family's face. They were like, what the hell is going on with you? Because now I've been living this double life, and suddenly there's this tweaker in the hospital that's saying this is all fake and ridiculous and it kind of got to a point where I broke down in the hospital and just said listen I'm, I'm on drugs you know and this was the first time they'd heard that well, they had heard from people but it was the first time out of my mouth that I was, I was on drugs and heavily on drugs um, from there I went straight to rehab they took me to a facility in Joburg for 28 days and you know, that 28 days was long because all I wanted to do was use. Um, I wasn't willing to listen to what the facility was saying. I was complying my way through there. Um, and even like, I think a day after I got into that facility, my family went to my flat to find drug dealers and people jawling in this flat and like there was Literally, it's like something out of a movie where there's like spray paint on the walls and I thought it was art and oh geez, I was mad. And um, they were so shocked from that, uh, that they kind of, they told me about it in rehab and I still didn't care. I, I felt nothing for it. Um, I, I still was blaming my dad from so long ago about his alcohol abuse, um, finding any excuse to kind of just Point, point the finger and not take responsibility for my life. Um, and yeah, I finished that 28 days. I never did my steps. I think I did up to step three, but it was a very diluted program there. So it wasn't really as in depth as the house on the hill. Um, had a sponsor and was told to go do meetings. And so I left the facility to go live with my parents of whom I resented the most and hated every minute of it. I, my mom gave me like a, an ultimatum, well not an ultimatum, she said like, you have to stay with me for a month before you can go back to your flat. And I said, cool, I'll do that, complied, went to a couple of meetings a week. Um, but back then, like I was just doing it all for the wrong reasons. I just was doing it just to get my parents off my back so I can go and do my own thing. Um, and when I was at those meetings, I was looking for, the differences and not the similarities, so I always set myself apart in those meetings, um, thinking like those people are worse than me, I'm not that bad, you know, my life's okay. Meanwhile, I've got no money, nowhere to stay at the moment, I'm living with my parents, um, but still in this mad delusion that I was going to make it in this music scene and part of this reality show. So I, I got put on antipsychotics. In, in that facility, which didn't shake my psychosis at all. I was still very much in psychosis, even on antipsychotics, which goes to show that like, they don't really work. Um, and eventually I stopped going to the meetings. Um, I felt that they weren't working for me. I just kept on telling my mom like, you know, those people are addicts and alcoholics, like I'm really not relating to this. And, um, wasn't using a sponsor at all, and as soon as I got the chance to go live back at my flat, um, it didn't take me long until I picked up again. Um, and then back in, back in the madness, I suppose, those people that were living with me had been kicked out. Uh, I had then invited them back into to my flat, but by not telling my parents again, and living this double life again, and I just went straight back into this mad cycle of of where, like, where I was. And I suppose through that whole process, I could start to see that like, I was repeating the same pattern again. And I was like, oh my God, this is not lacquer. Um, I can't believe I've had got these people back. I was now selling drugs again and just using every day um, in the madness. And that's when, uh, yeah, I, I suppose I, I used, at that point, um, I'd pushed my family away completely because now they had known, they knew that I was using because I was not answering phone calls. I was refusing to go to family occasions and I was just honest with my family again. I said, listen, I'm using, I don't want anything to do with you. Leave me alone. Like, just leave me to do what I want to do. And um, 
completely selfish at the time. Like I, I was, I wasn't even aware of how selfish that was. You know, I, I was just so focused on 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 myself and and using um, and that kind of led to lockdown. Um, lockdown happened and I had manipulated, I printed out this letterhead with this being a health worker um, so I could go and cruise and pick up drugs and I got stopped many times, presented this thing and they said it was cool. So I was this fake health worker cruising through lockdown, getting drugs and getting high and going to parties and stuff as much as I could. And um, eventually I was now living with uh, addicts and with no money, just trying to struggle and hustle and we, we all were struggling and hustling. And um, eventually they kicked me out because they couldn't support me. And I was now living in my car. <laughs> I couldn't couldn't go back home because now I pushed my whole family away. I told them I want nothing to do with them, and now I'm living in my car with no money and no drugs. And eventually, it got to a point of desperation, I suppose. Um, I lived in my car for about two weeks. Uh, that was horrible, and that's when I phoned my mom. I said, "Please, can you?" Please can I come and stay at home with you? Um, and through that, like, I, when I got there, I hadn't been using the drugs, the drug of my choice for about two weeks because I had this, this acid trip that kind of showed me what I was doing to myself through the, uh, through the meth. And um, I thought, sure, LSD is my savior. This is perfect. And I'm no longer going to pick it up, you know. So I was clean in my head for two weeks. Um, and I, my parents sat me down and they just had a lot of, a lot of desperation on their face and I, they said, I think you need treatment, you know, and, compl and I got really defensive again and I said, why, you know, I'm clean, even though I was smoking weed every day and still using psychedelics, um, in my mind and also drinking, but in my mind I was clean, um, again, the madness and, um, yeah, I suppose I just saw through the, the sheer desperation on their face that they were desperate and they needed me to get help. Um, and I was in a position where I didn't have much. I had nothing going for me. There was no gigs. Like It was um, the tail end of lockdown and nothing was happening in my life. And I, they said, listen, maybe three months away from Job it would do you good. And I thought, okay, yeah, that sounds cool. They did kind of convince me that I could go surfing every day at this facility and <laughs> it worked because I was like, yes, luck, I could learn surfing. And uh, that's what kind of took me down to the house on the hill. Um, and yeah, that's when I started to really hear the, hear the message. Um, again, a lot of compliance through that whole process because I wasn't willing to hand everything over to the care of God, you know. Um, I love how someone shared the one day how, how they didn't want to, they, they considered step three as they didn't want to hand their uh, will in their life over to the control of God. And that's kind of how I saw it as well. Um, I thought that I was going to be controlled and, and living this like, in, the, in my mind, I, recovery was like boring, mundane. I was going to be told what to do, especially from living a life of what I considered what was free and to do what I wanted was like chalk and cheese. I, I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to hand everything over. And when I put the drugs and alcohol down now for quite some time, I needed a fix. And that kind of led me to fix up someone, someone in, in the treatment facility. And I had a dishonest relationship in there. Um, again, my like manipulative and dishonest ways are quite good and I managed to pull the wool over most people's eyes in that facility and I got through the three months there without exposing that. Um, but fortunately my higher power kind of stepped in and exposed it for me whilst I was one day in the halfway house and um, I was kind of cornered after a meeting, uh, a big book meeting and, and told by the owner of the facility that the truth was out and that I had a choice to either 
leave the halfway house and go on my own or go back into treatment. And it was that moment where I kind of thought about going on my own and the fear kind of just overwhelmed me with the thought of going on my own ways because I had no money, I didn't know where to go, I didn't want to now tell my parents about all of this because I've wasted their money. Um, and I opted to go back into treatment, um, which was probably one of the hardest things I've had to do in, in my life, uh, was to go and face myself uh, for the first time. And yeah, I took three dick concern groups to like really shake that ego out of me and, and really for me to see what kind of person I was sober, you know, the selfish, dishonest, like I was, yeah, it was hard, hard, hard to hear that. Um, and thankfully I, I went through that whole process and got through it because that's where I probably got most of my growth was in that fourth month. It was when I really started to think, okay, I really need to change my behavior. I really need to relook really at my life and just change the picture completely because I don't want to hurt people anymore, you know. Fortunately, like in those concern groups, they get, gave the chance for the whole house to get, like give their kind of input of what what I'd done, and that like the the result was that I'd hurt people along the way, you know, broken trust of things that I'd made in 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 the facility, and I didn't want to be that person, you know. Um, so yeah, that's when I started to really change my behaviour and really work the program it's when i started to use my sponsor properly and, and just kind of start again from scratch um and fortunately I, I got the opportunity to go into the halfway house after that month and yeah that was really cool um again it took me a couple of months to kind of shake the the, the self-pity and the guilt from what i'd done um out of my system because it was that self-pity and, and, and the shame and the guilt, all it did was hold me back. Um, I was too scared to even engage in the halfway house. I was left to my life. I, I was doing my own thing. I wasn't really willing to kind of participate in much. Um, and fortunately, I was concerned for that in the halfway house. And I was told, like, I really need to just move on from what I've done. And that, from that day on is when I kind of started to realize, okay, cool, uh, I can do this. Um, and I suppose in that two months of, of being there and that self pity and shame and stuff, I was so scared to really expose how I was really feeling. So I, again, it's old behavior from the past was just to tell everyone I'm fine, I'm, I'm not fearful, I'm all good, but meanwhile inside I was petrified, like I couldn't find work. Um, I was even willing to like lose the whole halfway house and go back to Joburg to try and find a job. Fortunately, my sponsor said no. Um, all I needed to do was to basically get vulnerable and expose it to the house. Um, so I did that. I, after a concern group, I called the whole house together and I just told them where I was, where I was at, and I just apologised for kind of putting on this persona of, of trying to act like I'm in recovery when I was really fearful and stuff. Um, and the day after I did that, I got a job which was incredible, like that's my higher power working in all the ways. Um, and again, like moments like that, that happen, it just like reassures me that I'm, I'm going to be okay. You know, this program really does work. Um, my higher power really does exist because for a long time I was very doubtful that there was even a, a God or a higher power. Um, and it took me quite some time to really grasp the concept and start to fully believe that that was true. Um, so yeah, then I, I started working and, and from then on it's like this this year of recovery has just been really getting back to basics for me. Um, simple things like buying groceries and becoming independent, um, stuff that I'd never really learned from when I was growing up. Um, and to really stay plugged into the fellowship. I, I did my 1990 um, which was awesome. I got to really connect with the people in this fellowship of Scottborough and, and Pennington and um, 
yeah, it's, it's great because it's, it's, it's kept me here. You know, I, I have no ambitions to go back to Joburg because I suppose through this year I've, I've had a lot of realizations of like and memories of, of, of my past and kind of this new perspective, I suppose, of, of where I was at and what, how wrong it all was that um, me realizing that staying down here is a lot better for me, you know, it's, it's, it's safe, I suppose. Um, and I believe that my higher power has kind of guided me down to the south coast here into this fellowship for like many reasons, but one is, is to really learn about recovery. Um, I'm really blessed to have a lot of people in this fellowship have multiple years of recovery a lot of them are counselors at the facility that I was at, and I'm here just to like soak it all in, you know, taking as much of their knowledge as I can um, in order for me to carry the message. You know, I'll be honest, I haven't really carried much of the message to newcomers because I haven't really seen many newcomers. So I've kind of considered this this year is really just for me to learn as much as I can whilst I'm here, um, and obviously connect with with the people in this fellowship and and really. Um, make new friends in a new life. Um, they also mentioned in, in the facility that you know this program helps you to deal with life and life's terms. Um, so at the end of June, I think I was in my ninth month of recovery, my, my father passed away, um, sadly. And that was really difficult. Um, sure. Yeah, I, I, it's probably the first time that I've had to really like work a recovery and work a program in recovery. Um, that's when I kind of reached out to to my sponsor at that time. I reached out to a lot of people in this fellowship that had had the same experience, um, and I, I didn't pick up. You know, it's 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 been a probably it was it was a subconscious reservation in my mind that if something ever happened to my family and that that I'd probably pick up. Um, but fortunately that this program has given me enough knowledge in life to, to deal with life and life's terms, I suppose. Um, it's weird, like through the passing of my dad, I felt such an intense emotion that I'd never felt before. And it kind of made me feel more alive than I'd ever felt, if that makes sense. Um, and I, I, I realized then that Yo, I've been numbing my emotions for 17 years through drugs and alcohol for so long that like I was clueless as to how real emotions felt, you know. Um, and as sad as it was, like I kind of realized that I, I want to feel again, you know. I don't ever want to numb myself. Um, I was I at least had the opportunity to go up to Joburg for the funeral and, and be of support to my family, you know, something that I'd never even be willing to do. Um, I'm pretty sure an active eye would have rocked up their high or even, not even rocked up at all. Um, so it was nice to go up to my family and just pay respects to my dad um, and just, yeah, I'll be of, of a support and a pillar of, of love to my family that needed it. Um, and yeah, from there, like my recovery has been so lacquer, um, to be honest. There's a lot of serenity and a lot of peace. Currently living with two housemates uh, in Freedom Park in my sponsor's old house um, that I was in treatment with and at the halfway with. Um, so yeah, we're, we're a nice little unit together. Uh, we help each other a lot. Um, still attending meetings and, and like I'm really finding a, quite a big passion for this this program and, and this fellowship um, as well as the sister fellowship you know it's incredible what this 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 program has done for me from I'm sure you can imagine like the contrast of the madness that I was in in this like thought I was in a reality show that didn't exist for long to now just being present you know and, and having my mind kind of back to normal, I suppose. And yeah, currently working, I'm, I'm loving it. Um, I'm busy learning web design, which is something I've been wanting to do for so long, but my using just never allowed me to do it. 
So I'm, I'm learning new skills along the way. My housemate's teaching me a lot about business as well. So I'm just, yeah, I'm, I'm soaking in a lot of information at the moment in this year and I'm really, really grateful for it. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna leave it there. Thanks for letting me share.